Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Over the last few weeks we've been having a look at the numerous consequences of human beings burning fossil fuels and it's difficult to escape the conclusion that we may have caused irreversible changes that could jeopardise the existence of our civilization. In fact, the scientific community has become so concerned about the situation and so disillusioned with society's abject refusal to immediately start moving away from fossil fuels that they've even started to dream up ways that we can capture or even remove CO2 from our atmosphere. It's called geoengineering. There's two basic strategies, very straightforward, either stop so much heat from the sun reaching the planet in the first place or reduce the amount of heat that the Earth retains due to the greenhouse effect. Number one, pull down the blinds. Anyone who's ever set foot in a greenhouse knows that the glass lets all the heat and light inside but prevents the heat escaping back out again. Greenhouse owners get around this problem by controlling the amount of heat that gets in there in the first place. They just fit opaque blinds or apply a coat of whitewash paint to the glass panes. So all we need is a planet sized sun blind to pull down over certain parts of the atmosphere and we're completely sorted. On the 18th of May 1980, Mount St. Helens in the northwest of the United States erupted with an energy equivalent to 1500 Hiroshima atom bombs. On the 15th of June 1991, Mount Pinatubo exploded in a cataclysmic eruption that ejected more than 5 cubic kilometres of material 22 miles high. Both these eruptions spewed millions of tonnes of sulphur dioxide high up into the atmosphere, which reacted with water vapour to make sulphuric acid which in turn condensed in the stratosphere to make things called sulphate aerosols, which just happened to act like billions of tiny mirrors, reflecting sunlight back into space. The result was that in both cases the skies dimmed a little and the average global temperature went down by about 1 degree Celsius for a couple of years. So some scientists speculated that we could mimic the effects of volcanoes without actually having the eruptions. What if we took a fleet of, say, a few hundred jumbo jets and flew them around the world once a year, releasing sulphur dioxide into the atmosphere? That way we could keep spewing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and as long as we were also spewing sulphur dioxide into the atmosphere in sufficient quantity as well, the two actions would cancel each other out. Any self-respecting conspiracy theorist will recognise this as the story of chemtrails, which apparently some people believe NASA and other agencies have been spewing out of the back of aeroplanes for decades. The real risk of mass sulphur dioxide dispersion is that it may well cause catastrophic air pollution and it'll certainly cause acid rain. As well as this, it has the inconvenient side effect of destroying the ozone layer, which is the planet's main protection against deadly ultraviolet radiation from the sun and which has only just started to recover from the last time we battered it with CFCs. Number two, mirrors in space. Instead of pumping sulphates into the atmosphere, why not just build a massive mirror out in space to reflect the sun's rays harmlessly out into the cosmos? Geoengineers have worked out the numbers and they've reassured us that the mirror would only need to be about the size of Greenland. Maybe we don't need to go to the trouble of building a country-sized mirror. This guy, Roger Angel of the University of Arizona, has proposed firing a trillion or so tiny mirrors, each about 60 centimetres across, up into space to make a kind of reflective cloud, about twice the width of the planet. He calculates that if we get the positioning right, then the cloud will be held in a static position between the gravity of Earth and the gravity of the Sun. Obviously he recognises that even if such technology was remotely close to existing, it would cost hundreds of trillions of dollars to produce, that apart from immediately ceasing the burning of fossil fuels and moving to renewable energies to power our civilizations. What is the realistic alternative to a planet-sized reflective space cloud held in a perfectly balanced suspension between the Sun and the Earth? Number three, cloud seeding. Clouds do reflect sunlight back into space, so logically if we could increase the amount of cloud cover over the Earth, we could probably keep the temperature down to a more manageable level. Ever since the airplane was invented, man's been trying to seed the clouds, usually in an attempt to produce more rain to encourage the growth of agricultural crops. But the kind of cloud seeding that the geoengineers are talking about is on an altogether more massive scale than aircraft could ever achieve. As far back as 2007, these two guys, Stephen Salter and John Latham, came up with a design for a cloud seeding boat. Their idea was to have about 1500 of these boats spouting water vapour up into the atmosphere at strategically planned locations around the globe. Now it's fair to say that this idea would be much cheaper than space mirrors. The only drawback is that once again there's no way of knowing what the side effects would be. By definition, clouds contain water, and that water is only going to want to go in one direction. We're already moving into the realms of unprecedented flooding frequency around the globe, so dragging even more water out of the oceans, and ultimately dumping it over the land, may not be the smartest move. 
As well as this, none of the ideas so far has addressed the accelerating increase in human CO2 emissions which are continuing to accumulate in our atmosphere and acidify our oceans, or the loss of forestry land which is causing desertification all over the world. So what about physically removing carbon dioxide from our industrial processes or even directly from out of the atmosphere itself? Number four, carbon capture and storage. This one is a big favorite of the fossil fuel producers and the big industries like chemicals, cement and steel. It's also being advocated by the UK Committee on Climate Change chaired by Lord Deben, or as older folks like me know him, John Selwyn Gummer, as a key element of the UK's programme to meet the 2030 CO2 emissions targets set by the 2015 Paris Agreement. You know, the one Donald pulled the United States of America out of a year ago. The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. Let's put him on the map. Oh no, he's on there already. Government and industry tell us that they're developing technologies to remove carbon dioxide from the exhaust emissions of their industrial plants and compress it into a liquid that could then be injected safely deep down into the ground where it would be locked away for millions of years. It's what Donald Trump means when he says beautiful, clean coal. But it turns out it's actually quite a difficult thing to do, not just technically speaking, but also in terms of the waste storage. It's a similar problem that the nuclear industry have with their waste storage sites. Nevertheless, in January 2017, NRG Energy were the first to successfully retrofit a carbon capture and storage system to an existing power generating facility in Thompson, Texas, for which they received a $190 million grant from the US Department of Energy. The system purportedly aims to remove about 1.4 million tonnes of CO2 per year from the facility's emissions, which sounds great, but this Texas facility is the only one of its kind in the United States a country that still produces 35% of its power from coal-fired power generated facilities and currently spews about 5,000 million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. And get this, the good folks at NRG Energy, not wishing to miss an opportunity to build real efficiency into their processes and balance books, have configured their new system so that the liquefied CO2 that they recover is pumped across to their nearby oil field at West Ranch, Texas where it's shoved into the ground at enormous pressure to facilitate what they call Enhanced Oil Recovery, or EOR. They proudly claim that this has increased oil production at the facility from 300 barrels a day to 15,000 barrels a day. I mean, you couldn't make it, I'm not making it up, I promise. Number five, ocean fertilization, otherwise known as iron seeding. Phytoplankton take on massive amounts of CO2 as part of their photosynthesis. In fact, the oceans, are one of the biggest reservoirs of CO2 we've got on the planet. Iron turns out to be one of the key stimulants to the growth of these algae. The theory is that by dumping huge volumes of tiny iron particles in the ocean, we'd encourage algal blooms that would draw loads of CO2 out of the atmosphere and sink it safely to the bottom of the sea when the phytoplankton die. Small scale trials have been carried out in the last decade or so, but with very mixed results. In some areas, the iron made no discernible difference at all. In other instances, the extra CO2 made the water more acidic, and in a couple of cases, the algae simply got eaten up by the surrounding sea life, putting the CO2 back into the food chain. And of course, we'd have to continue doing it for as long as we're producing CO2 elsewhere, so it's really just another sticking plaster, not a cure. Number six, ocean pipes. In 2007, a somewhat left field climate scientist by the name of James Lovelock proposed a system of massive vertical pipes about 200 meters long that would float in the ocean. The bottom end of the pipe would be so far down that it would be in the very cold part of the deep water and a system of valves would draw the cold water up through the pipe and spit it out at the top where it would cool down the surface water. Organic matter apparently grows better in cold conditions than it does in warm conditions so his theory was that this cold water coming up from the depths would stimulate better growth of the algae. As well as being a quite mind-boggling engineering challenge the results would be just as unproven as the iron seeding. The side effects of potential ocean acidification would be the same, and a study by the Carnegie Institute in 2015 suggested that the Earth's system would simply revert back to equilibrium or possibly even a worse climatic state after only a few decades. Number seven, last but not least, biochar. People have been making charcoal for thousands of years by heating wood and agricultural waste products like stems and roots and what have you. The basic principle of biochar is the same, except with more efficient modern apparatus like this one. 
and with the obvious difference that the carbon rich biochar would be buried underground to lock the carbon away. This is technically the simplest of all the ideas. The only snag is that to make it at all effective on a global scale, really massive quantities of material would have to be used, and we'd also have to set aside millions of square kilometres of land to make it possible. And that's land that's already being battled over for reforestation, urbanisation and food production. There's a scene in an episode of The Simpsons when a doctor tells Mr Burns that he's suffering from every disease known to man, but that each disease is cancelling out the other, so actually he was in perfect health. Mr Burns takes this to mean that he's indestructible, but the doctor points out that even so much as a light breeze could knock the diseases out of balance and kill him instantly. That's kind of what's going on with geoengineering. We just don't know what we're playing with. The very fact that rational and intelligent governments and scientists are even contemplating some of these schemes shows just how dire they know our predicament has become. Geoengineering has completely polarised opinion with some scientists pushing for a far greater removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and an immediate halt to the expansion of land use for the production of meat for human consumption, while other scientists are absolutely convinced we're so far past the point of no return that we've got absolutely nothing to lose by gambling on unknown quantities and technologies that might have completely disastrous side effects. There's also no political consensus for geoengineering either. So what can we do as individuals to contribute to the debate? Well, we've all got two very powerful things in our armoury, especially if we use them collectively, and those two things are our money and our voice. In 2017, the big five banks were still investing more than three times as much in fossil fuels as they were in renewable energy. But ordinary folks like you and me have been moving away from these banks, and as a result, for example, in April this year, HSBC, which happens to be Europe's biggest bank, announced it was pulling out of pretty much all of its fossil fuel investments. They didn't do that because they suddenly got compassion for the environment, they did it because they could see the direction the balance books were going if they didn't act quickly to stem the flow of customers away from their business. So you can take your money away from a bank if you disagree with its investment strategy and put it in a bank that doesn't invest in funds that are harmful to the environment. Co-op's a good example, but there are others. The same goes for pension funds, insurance companies, and all sorts of other financial institutions. It's called divestment, and I'm gonna put it on the WTF board because it deserves a program all of its own. You can also talk to your local MP. They're effectively employed by us, so they're duty bound to represent our views in parliament. Here's the website where you can find out not only who your MP is, but also what their address, telephone number, direct email address, and social media sites are. That's it for this week. If you've enjoyed watching this show, do click the subscribe button and the notification bell to get alerts when the new shows come out. And please do share the link with your friends to get the word out to as many people as possible. As always, thank you very much for watching. Have a great week. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.